Hello everyone and um, welcome to the live Q&A webinar. Um, it's the 25th anniversary of the Science Centre this year, would have been the 16th Astronomy Festival. It's all a bit sad really, um, the sun was shining, the sky was blue this morning and I just wanted to walk through a whole camping field of, of astronomers that had been up all night looking at a beautiful sky. Um, but it's such a fantastic atmosphere, but unfortunately a certain pandemic has got in the way. Um, anyway, we couldn't let it slip by unnoticed. Um, I hope you've been enjoying some of the broadcast this morning. Um, if you're able to support the centre, sorry, shameless plug, then please, uh, please can you go and, and help us. We've got a crowdfunder uh, on our webpage. But anyway, uh, without further ado, um, I'm going to hand over to Steve in a minute, um, who's from the University of Sussex. He's put all this together uh, for me, which is absolutely brilliant. But I also want to thank all our panellists. Uh, thanks very much for giving up your time um, for us. Um, very much appreciated. So, with, as I say, without further ado, I'm going to hand over to um, Steve Wilkins from the University of Sussex and enjoy the Q&A. Thank you very much for coming along. Hello everyone and thank you Sandra for the welcome. So my name is Dr Stephen Wilkins and by virtue of being the closest geographically astronomer to the Observatory Science Centre, I'm going to be chairing today's Q&A. So what we're going to do is, this should, hopefully people are now familiar with Zoom, but there's a, a Q&A feature on Zoom where you can type in your questions and they appear to me. So the way we're going to do this is if you can send your questions that way, so using the Q&A feature, um, then what I'm going to do is read them out to the panel and then I will nominate one of the panel to try and answer that question um, before allowing other members of the panel to also um, try and answer the question as well. So as I said, my name is Dr. Stephen Wilkins. I'm a reader here at the University of Sussex, just outside Brighton. Um, my particular research actually focuses on using the Hubble Space Telescope and in the future, the James Webb Space Telescope to explore the most distant galaxies in the universe. So I'm now just going to let all of my panel members uh, introduce themselves, hopefully in alphabetical order. So you can go first, Joe. Hi, um, I'm Joe Barstow. I'm a lecturer in astronomy at the Open University. And I study the atmospheres of other planets, mostly exoplanets, so planets that orbit other stars, but also some of the planets in our solar system. Hi, I'm Michelle Collins. I'm a lecturer at the University of Surrey. Uh, I'm an observational astronomer, and I usually focus on studying very nearby galaxies, like our neighbouring galaxy Andromeda, and also the smallest galaxies in the universe, like little tiny dwarf galaxies. Um, in the hopes of learning more about dark matter. So, hi, I'm Dr Tim Davis from uh, Cardiff University over here in, in Wales. Uh, my research focuses on uh, nearby galaxies as well, a bit further away than the ones Michelle typically studies, but nearby in cosmic terms, um, looking both at the cold gas that lives within them uh, and how that affects their evolution, but also at the supermassive black holes that lie at their hearts. Hi everybody, coming a little bit closer to home. My name is Lee Fletcher. I'm a planetary scientist here at the University of Leicester, specialising in studying uh, gas giant atmospheres. I've been involved in the Cassini mission uh, to Saturn, currently the Juno mission to Jupiter, and in a few years time, the Jupiter Icy Moons Explorer that will be heading off to explore the satellites of Jupiter. Io, Europa, Ganymede and Callisto. And I'm Chris Lintot. I'm an astronomer at the University of Oxford and presenter of the BBC Sky at Night. Um, my day job is trying to understand the universe and I'm easily distractible. So I work on galaxies, I dabble in trying to find planets and I look for supernovae, all of which I do with the help of the two million registered volunteers on Zooniverse.org who through citizen science help us uh, understand what's hidden in our data. And I'm Elizabeth Stanway. Uh, I'm an associate professor at the University of Warwick uh, and I study galaxies ranging from local ones to distant ones, but with a particular interest in the stellar populations. So the stars that make up their galaxies and how they influence their surroundings. Thank you Elizabeth and thank you everybody else. Um, we actually have a very useful question here first of all from Rob uh, Bevan, I believe that's how you pronounce your name. Um, and Rob has asked, perhaps each of the panel members can 
give us a short snippet about what is currently exciting them most in astronomy and space science. So have a think about that for the next minute. I'm going to give my answer. So although I work on um, very distant galaxies, in the last 10 years, I've, I've kind of come to realize that actually I think one of the most exciting things that's changing is our ability to actually find and characterize um, planets around other stars. So the things that Lee and which Joe work on. So I'm very, very jealous of, of both of them because this is a field which has grown amazingly over the last decade. And we're now at the point where we can actually look at the atmospheres of planets around other stars and be almost able to say what they contain. Um, in particular, one of the things I really look forward to is next year's launch, fingers crossed, of the James Webb Space Telescope, which will really help this field. Um, how about you, Joe? Um, so uh, continuing to talk about something that's not in my field at all. Um, one of the things that I don't do that I found really exciting over the last few years um, has been the discovery of gravitational waves from various different mergers of supermassive objects of varying kinds. Um, so there was there was a, a, a medium sized, I think, black hole merger last week. Um, and the statistic that is really astonishing is that eight solar masses were lost and converted into gravitational waves. So lost from the merger and converted into gravitational waves that reached us. That's something that's it's stuff that's eight times as massive as the sun that we were able to detect. Um, and I find that really interesting. I think it's really exciting we've been able to do that. How about you, Michelle? I was going to say almost exactly the same thing. <laughs> so yeah, gravitational waves is this very new you know, uh, way of studying the universe, which I think has a lot of astronomers exciting, excited because it's opened a whole new window on how we can study the distant universe. And, you know, at the moment we're learning a lot more about black holes. And that same discovery that Joe was talking about, this detection of an, an intermediate mass black hole, so not one of the small black holes that's sort of comparable to the size of a star, and not one of the supermassive black holes that we find in massive galaxies, but something in between. And uh, people have been looking for these for a long time. And but it's not clear whether they exist or not. Um, so this has been the first sort of secure detection of one of these uh, sort of intermediate mass black holes. It's at the low end of the intermediate mass range, though, depending on who you talk to. But to me, I know a lot of people in my field have been trying to to find intermediate mass black holes for a long time as a, better, as a way of explaining how black holes form into supermassive black holes, for example. So for me, that's been a really exciting discovery just this week. Thanks, Michelle. And how about you, Tim? Yeah, so I think all of those things are obviously really exciting. So I'll go for something a little bit different, and that's uh, the new facilities that are going to be coming online in the next 10 or 15 years. So uh, the ones that are really exciting me, obviously, you already mentioned James Webb, um, but there's also the new ground-based telescopes. So the 40-meter class telescopes, like the extremely large telescope that's being built in Chile at the moment by the European Southern Observatory, that's going to be revolutionary in many ways. Uh, and also the Square Kilometre Array, a giant radio telescope that's going to be split between um, Australia and South Africa that's going to be uh, just revolutionary in what we can do in the radio sky. How about you, Lee? Is there anything else? Well, following on a little bit from what uh, Tim was just saying, in radio wavelengths, when you look at the, the planets, it allows you to probe down through the outermost layers that we're all familiar with from looking through a telescope. So for the past sort of well, 40 or 50 years of planetary exploration, all we've been able to do when we look at Jupiter, Saturn, Uranus and Neptune is just scratch the surface and see the colourful cloud tops. But things like the Very Large Array, things like the uh, ALMA facility out in Chile and also the, the Juno mission in orbit around Jupiter, they all carry with them uh, facilities to be able to probe down through those clouds and figure out what's going on at much, much deeper down uh, inside these planets. And that's something we've, we've never been able to do before. We're very lucky to be seeing the inner workings of these worlds for the first time. And it's great that it's on our watch. We can go into the lab every day, or we used to be able to go into the lab every day and see new data coming in from these facilities that uh, blow your mind whenever you see them. And Chris? Um, well, um, we have the next episode of The Sky at Night, <laughs> which is a week on Monday, is about a secret discovery that I'm not allowed to talk about. So that, but if I'm not allowed to talk about that, 
then um, somebody should say exoplanets because over the last um, 15 years or so, it's been amazing to, to come to the realization that the variety of planets that exist in the galaxy is much greater than I think many people expected. We see um, planets that are very close to their parent star, planets that are different sizes from the ones we have, planets uh, in all sorts of environments. And watching the science of planetary physics build up on those discoveries and understand what these discoveries are telling us about our solar system has, has been just amazingly exciting. It's been a great time to be an astronomer. So I'll, I'll just say the most exciting thing is anything to do with exoplanets. Thank you. Elizabeth? Well, you've left me the hard job, but uh, <laughs> I'm actually going to, to come at this from left field slightly. All of what has been uh, mentioned already is fantastic and groundbreaking and wonderful, but we wouldn't be able to understand any of it without the fantastic work being done by theory and computational astrophysics that provides the framework and structure that, that lets us interpret Oh, I think we've just lost Elizabeth, at least I have. Yeah, I can't hear her either. That's a shame. Uh, hopefully we'll catch up with Elizabeth in a second. This is one of the perils of using Zoom. Um, oh, sorry, Elizabeth, we lost you there at the very end. Oh, well, uh, but let's just say computers and stop there. Excellent. As, as half a theorist, I'm very happy to actually somebody to mention theory in there as well. Okay. Great. I'm going to come back to something that Chris said a little bit later, but before then, let's, uh, let's have a look at some of the other questions. So I think this first question is best directed at Tim, and this is from Paul Shepard, who asks, how do supermassive black holes with masses of millions or even billions of mass of the sun in the centre of galaxies form? Yeah, this is a really, really good question. The answer is that nobody really knows. There's a couple of competing theories. Uh, you could classify them as two different theories or three, depending on who you speak to. Um, the first theory is that you have a, um, a normal star that lives through its life and it explodes in a supernova. And then the remnant collapses down to a black hole. We know this happens in our own galaxy. And those black holes then would be up to, let's say, 100 solar masses in size, maybe a little bit smaller. And then over time, those could, in principle, accrete enough material from around themselves, from the clouds of gas that live around them, especially at very high redshift. If enough of that material can be made to fall onto that black hole, you can grow it. But it's actually really, really difficult for that black hole to eat enough material in the amount of time that the universe has been going to reach the sort of masses that was talked about there, so millions, billions of solar masses. Because every time something falls in, it gets hot as it falls in, and that radiation it then emits will push back stuff that's falling in behind. So there's a limit to how much black holes can eat. And so that really sets the sort of bounds on this. So to get around this, there's a couple of ways you can do that. Maybe in the very, very high redshift universe, the, um, the stars that lived then were diff different from how they are now. So Elizabeth works on this and, and Steve, I think, as well. Um, so those stars, they could be very, very massive indeed. So maybe when they collapse down, you form much bigger seed black holes that can eat enough material in the time available to become that massive. Alternatively, perhaps what you have is lots of these small black holes that end up coalescing um, over time in a dense environment like the very centre of a galaxy. So you can really start to form that from each mergers of many smaller black holes. Uh, and then finally, there's a really extreme theory where at very, very high redshifts, you can, in principle, in simulations at least, get conditions that allow the gas to collapse directly to a black hole without ever having been a star. That's called direct collapse. Now, we don't know which one of these is true. There's a lot of active research going on to this. And looking at these sort of intermediate mass black holes that Michelle mentioned is one way that you can do this. You can say, OK, we can get things this size from the stellar mergers. Um, so that's really exciting that that's happening right now as we speak. Thanks a lot, Tim. That was great. I think this next question is for Lee. And uh, this is an anonymous person asking, what does JUICE hope to discover and how is it different from Juno? 
Okay, so the, the Juno spacecraft, when it launched back in 2011, was really dedicated to the study of the planet itself. It's looking at the interior structure of Jupiter, it's looking at the magnetic field of Jupiter, and it's looking at the atmosphere of Jupiter, sort of filling the gap between the external environment and what's going on deep down in its centre. So Juno is in a uh, polar orbit, very, very close to the planet and, and gets close once every 53 days or so as it's orbiting around. JUICE, on the other hand, is not really focused on the planet Jupiter itself. It's more focused on the environmental conditions that we're going to uh, explore on the surfaces of the icy moons. So its intended target ultimately is Ganymede, the largest moon in our solar system and the only moon with its own magnetic field, which means that you get these incredible things like uh, auroral light shows on the surface of an icy satellite, which we don't see uh, anywhere else. Um, Juno, on the other hand, spends so much of its time close to the planet, it doesn't have the opportunity to explore those icy moons. Now, JUICE carries with it an ice penetrating radar, which I think is one of the most exciting instruments on board this spacecraft, because what that can do is it can probe hopefully up to 10 kilometers down through the icy crust of Ganymede, the icy crust of Europa, and potentially the crust of uh, Callisto as well. And what it's looking for are small pockets of liquid water that might be trapped within the ice. And if we're really lucky, it might see the transition between the icy crust and the deep, dark, hidden oceans that lie beneath those icy crusts. And those oceans are maybe some of the most tantalizing places for planetary explorers right now, because they might have all the right ingredients for what we call habitability, not necessarily life to exist, but habitable conditions away from the surface of the Earth. And I think that's something that uh, all planetary scientists and scientists in general are excited about looking at. So that's why JUICE is going to launch in 2022, touch wood, uh, will sail onto Jupiter by 2029 and spend three years orbiting Jupiter and a final year in orbit around Ganymede. So watch this space. Fantastic. Thanks, Lee. I mean, I've always been excited in uh, the icy moons of Jupiter since reading Arthur C. Clarke's novels uh, and seeing 2001 Space Odyssey and 2010 A Space Odyssey. Uh, when I was young, so it's really fascinating to see this and really hope we find something really interesting. One thing I noticed in that question, Steve, just before we finish, was that um, uh, the, our anonymous attendee was wondering whether it was NASA who had chosen that particular mission. Now, I want to set the record straight. That is a European Space Agency mission, and we're very, very proud of the fact that it's Europe that's going to be going to uh, explore the icy moons of Jupiter in the 2020s. Well done for capturing that, Leah. That is really important. Um, the next question is quite a general question. So this is from Jessica Connor, who asks, if you're interested in astronomy, but are maybe not so fantastic at physics or astrophysics or maths, what is one of the, one of the ways that you could get interested in astronomy? So obviously this is a very general question, but I think, uh, Michelle, do you have any comments on this, first of all? Then maybe see if any of the other panel members want to say something. So one of the things I like about astronomy is, is it's, it's somewhat fundamental in that we're all just looking up at the sky and then it's just how much detail you're looking at the sky in. So I do think it's quite a visual science in many ways. Um, and it's also quite a creative one because, you know, in other sciences, you have these experiments that you can design, set up, measure, run and again and again and again. But in astronomy, the experiment is basically the universe. It's already been run. And then we're just trying to find innovative ways to look at it, to learn about how the universe formed, how everything's been evolving uh, and, and stuff like that. So I think for me, that's kind of one of the focusing less on the, you know, you have to be great at math, you have to be great at physics. It's also just about like people's interest, I think, in how everything got to look the way it does and what else is out there in the universe. So it is, you know, I think there's a lot of, um, the visual aspects, creative aspects, and sort of a lot of imagination as well when you're trying to to do something like astronomy. So I think it, it sort of transcends physics and maths as well, I think, and it's very accessible, I think, to a, a wide range of people. Can I, can, do you mind if I add to that a bit? Yeah, I think of it's So certainly if it's just an interest in astronomy, then go and look at, look at the sky. That's where lots of us started, and, and it's still the thing that it inspires me to, to pay attention. I also think we're very lucky in astronomy in that most of, occasionally the details need to be in, in mathematics, but most of the ideas that we wrestle with are 
well described in in words and 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 in other ways and there's an amazing variety of people writing really well on cutting edge science in astronomy so so um i would i would just try and read as much as possible that's not true in other areas of science and i think i think being trans astronomy can be translated for anyone and um, i i think i'm not sure if the question was about career in astronomy and the one thing i'd say is that if what inspires you as a career is it is getting involved in astronomy but you don't think of yourself as a physicist um there are many routes to play a part in adventures like Lee's mission to the Galilean moons of Jupiter. You know, space agencies need all sorts of skills. Big projects need all sorts of skills, from engineers to software people to to people who just know how to organise big projects. And so, I think if you want a career in space, more generally, not literally in space, that's a bit different. Then there are lots of different ways in. And I, I think thinking creatively beyond just I'm going to be a physicist with a blackboard and solve equations about black holes. Uh, I think that's a good idea. Can I just pick up on something that Michelle said, and that was uh, the word creativity, uh, because one of the things that's impressed me looking at uh, data coming back from, from spacecraft is that a lot of the images are available to the general public immediately for them to play with. And what they do is they take these sometimes rather uh, I, I hesitate to use the word, but bland images of a planetary surface. And they're able to manipulate that using photographic skills, software skills, coding skills to pull out absolutely exquisite detail that the rest of us might not have been able to, to notice. So I've been really impressed in that sort of citizen science aspect that's coming from a perspective of creativity and a, a lot of software design to pull things out of data sets that we might have missed otherwise. Thanks, Lee. Um, does anybody else have anything else to add there? Well, if not, I'm going to ask a, a slightly controversial question, maybe a little bit of a meme one now. So this is more of a question for myself, but it, it's kind of been picked up by, by Chris already, and um, a few people have kind of mentioned aspects of this. So as I understand from Chris, there is a, a big announcement due on Monday, which has caused a week the sky night. A week on Monday. Oh, OK. Yep but it's caused the sky at night to be moved by day in order to presumably avoid the embargo and actually be able to report on this. I'm going to ask all the other panel members, other than Chris, to speculate what you think this discovery might be. I'm going to so hide gonna... my video because I have the worst poker face in the world. And, so and, I will look I forward think... to finding out what people come up with. I'm pretty sure I know what it is because of, I think I know some of the co-authors, so I'm also going to keep quiet. Ooh, okay, okay. So, well, I now have two guesses, so I'm going to start off with my two guesses. One of these is going to be the discovery of a, a, a very large object, maybe even something that would be classified as a planet on the outskirts of the solar system, which will be planet nine or planet X. Um, actually, I'm just going to stick with that one. That's my guess. Uh, how about you, Michelle? I was going to guess the same thing, actually. I mean, yes, that would be my guess for what was what is likely. If I would like have something that would really excite me is like even more it would be that someone's discovered dark matter but i feel like they wouldn't be able to keep that a secret so <laughs> yeah i agree how about you tim yeah i think those are really good guesses um if i had to go for something else maybe some interesting signature has been seen in the atmospheres of some of the solar system planets or moons some some gas or something or the the rover on mars has detected something interesting that would be really cool how about you, Lee? Well, I see a lot of uh, uh, press releases about us discovering Earth 2.0, and it's never quite as um, exciting as maybe it's made out to be. Maybe it's not quite Earth-like in, in that regard, but maybe this time they have actually found the Holy Grail and found a world that's similar to our own Earth with a similar sort of atmosphere in a similar sort of orbit with a similar sort of temperatures. Maybe that's what they're going to talk about uh, next week. Elizabeth, do you have any ideas? You keep leaving me for last. Um, it means I'm running with alphabetical order. I was also going to go with biosignatures, possibly from exoworlds even, rather than solar system worlds. Um, it's hard to say, but the sensitivity people are getting on exoworld atmospheres these days is very good. Um, a, a left field suggestion might be something on the gravitational wave side, but realistically, I. I I don't think there's anything coming up that I wouldn't have heard of. 
but I might be wrong. <laughs> Thank you. I, I enjoyed all of the speculation. It's, uh, it's so a Steve, when, uh, when Chris turns his video back on, we should ask him whether it's aliens or not. <laughs> <laughs> I am but, literally forbidden to say anything. He, he does have a terrible poker face, you're right. <laughs> My worry was that since it was 2020 and given everything else that was happening this year, we were going to see an asteroid coming towards us or something. No, I'd be shouting about that. My favourite suggestion is that astronomers have discovered that it's still April. <laughs> which would explain an awful lot about this year. So. Okay, great. Thanks, everyone, again. Um, I think now we've got a good question from Michelle. So this is from Jay Brand, who asks, can we see effect of dark matter or even dark energy on galaxies in the local group? So dark matter in the local group, yes. So um, I would say that it's probably fair to say that the, the main or even only constraints that come on dark matter, well, not only, some of the main constraints that are coming on the presence and the, the properties of dark matter at the moment are coming from astronomy and largely from studying um, how galaxies move and how the stars within galaxies move. Um, and so Andromeda is actually one of the first, one of the galaxies which um, uh, Vera Rubin actually studied uh, how fast the stars are moving in its disk. Um, so it's a big spiral galaxy, just like ours, and the stars spin around the center. And by measuring how fast they spin, you can work out how much mass or how, how much the galaxy must weigh. And when looking at galaxies like Andromeda and other spiral galaxies in the universe, Vera Rubin showed that all the, the disks are spinning so fast that they're all look like they're about to just sort of spin themselves apart um, because there's just there, there's not enough mass or stuff in terms of stars and gas to hold all that together if it's moving so quickly and so that was really one of the observations that sort of convinced the community that there has to be a whole bunch of other stuff that makes up galaxies like Andromeda like the Milky Way um, that we can't observe directly using light and so that's where dark matter uh, the, sort of the need for dark matter really came from or was sort of at least the community began to agree that we needed dark matter and so within the local group I actually study a lot of very interesting galaxies that are far smaller than the Andromeda galaxy and the Milky Way um, so they so if the Milky Way has 100, 100 billion stars 100 million stars sorry <laughs> um, the galaxies I study have more like a few tens of thousands stars uh, and they're mostly made of dark matter. So they have very low numbers of stars. And so you can use the stars to really measure how much dark matter there must be in the very centers of these galaxies. And that helps us much better understand um, the properties of the dark matter particle. Um, so how massive it must be, uh, how well self-interacting it must be, uh, and properties like that. So there's lots of studies of dark matter within the local nearby universe that I would argue are placing some of the best constraints on the properties of dark matter. Dark energy um, is not something we tend to measure so much in the in the local group. I think those the the evidence from dark for dark energy comes from studies of galaxies much further away and from studying supernova explosions in a range of galaxies. Uh, I think, uh, and I know much less about dark energy, but I I also think that's true of most astronomers. <laughs> that's great, Michelle. Yeah, just um, just to agree with you there at the very end, dark energy. We really need to kind of be away from the, the gravitational influence of matter. So when we've got lots of galaxies close together, it's very difficult to discern the effect of dark energy. So we're looking on much larger scales. Okay, so there's another, um, I guess, more general question here, which I might um, target Elizabeth because she was feeling left out of being always at the end of the alphabet, but obviously I know that more than she does. Uh, <laughs> and this question is, if invited, what would you like to contribute to the next golden record? And I guess this is a, an allusion to the golden record that was part of the Pioneer 10 and 11? It was the Voyager um, ones. Was, was it the Voyager was ones? The, yeah. Yeah. Um, so Elizabeth, do you have any thoughts on that? Yeah, it's a really good question. Um, and it's one that actually surprisingly comes up surprisingly often in things like science fiction. So. Arthur C. Clarke wrote a story, for example, of human beings uncovering an archive left by an alien race that knew they were going to be extinct. So uh, I actually, with groups of students, set them this question, what would you try and preserve of Earth culture? And it's always surprising the answers that come back. You could argue for science, but arguably any scientific culture that any culture capable of finding and decoding 
Oh, archive would have better science than us anyway. So you're really looking at arts and literature and things which cause emotive reactions, not necessarily just cultural ones. Uh, I'm not sure I could pin it down to one article, but I do think it's a very useful question for making us think about what we value of, of humanity. Yeah, it's a fantastic question. That's a fantastic answer, Elizabeth. Um, yeah, really, thanks for that. Um, this next one, again, it's not your area, Joe, but I'm going to direct it at you because I know obviously you've been an RAS counsellor in the past and this is something which is the RS is thinking about right now. But what are your thoughts on the large satellite constellations, including Starlink and uh, OneWeb, which I now believe is partly owned by the UK government, so maybe there's conflicts here. Um, what do you think about those? And maybe some other people can comment on these as well. Fortunately, I'm a space-based astronomer mostly, uh, so I don't worry as much. But how um, about you answer first? So there is a lot of concern, um, obviously, because it's becoming apparent that there is significant contamination from these satellites in images that are taken from the ground, and it's not necessarily trivial to subtract those effects from the image afterwards without losing some of the information that we're looking for. I think there's actually another separate concern as well, um, which is you know, mainly a consequence of the fact that this is completely unregulated. And that is that the more stuff we put up there, the more likely there is to be a collision. If you get collisions in orbit and things break up, then you get lots and lots of debris in orbit, which is problematic then when you want to launch something else because it can cause problems with the launch. And obviously, if you end up with a lot of very diffuse debris, that's going to be far worse for our view of the sky long term than having a discrete number of things where, that you know are going to cross at a certain time. So just populating orbit with that many satellites is problematic in itself, actually, um, for lots of things. Um, Chris, Chris will know, um, we, were, we had a, a, conf a Dot Astro conference um, just over a week ago and I was actually part of a hack group that wrote a, a very snarky song about Starlink, which may make it um, onto the wider internet at some point when we've sort of polished it up a bit. So watch this space. Thanks for that, Joe. Does anybody else have any thoughts on Starlink? Yeah, sorry. Liz, oh, I was just going to mention uh, I'm involved to some extent with gravitational wave transient follow-up. For that you have to map very large areas of sky and you have to do it quickly and any wide field imaging project like that at the moment is subject to, to really quite extensive contamination from these Starlink trails, particularly when you're looking for things that are varying in brightness between images. If you have uh, satellites going across the image. Yes, it may only affect a small amount of the image, but if that's going across what you're looking at, that can be catastrophic for time series and time analysis. Yeah, so I'm involved in the Vera Rubin Observatory, which is this big survey that used to be known as LSST that's going to survey the whole sky that's available to it every three nights. And, and the estimate is sort of in the hun at least the hundreds of thousands of dollars uh, to deal with this problem just from Starlink. I'm worried slightly that astronomers as a whole um, have, have got ourselves at the wrong end of this in the sense that um, at the minute these companies are planning to launch satellites and we're talking about how to mitigate those effects. So um, SpaceX have actually been reasonably cooperative in thinking of ways to make their satellites fainter or, or to try and reduce the impact on, a, on astronomy. And, and there was a big report out about a week ago that explained all the ways that, that such companies could um, could be nicer to astronomers. Um, in particular, sort of making them fainter makes it easier and it means it doesn't disrupt the, the uh, aesthetic enjoyment of the night sky. But actually, um, the thing that bothers me is that none of that consideration happens before launch. If I want to put a new motorway across a hillside, I have to explain to the people living there uh, why I want to do that and what the benefits and costs are going to be. I think we need desperately to get to the point where internationally, if you want to launch satellites, you explain, as Joe says, there's a cost to other satellites, there's a cost to people on the ground. And then you could say, OK, if I'm going to provide the internet for everyone and here's my business case and it makes sense, then maybe that's that that's OK and that's worth doing. But at the minute, we have satellites going up and then we're relying on goodwill and that that's going to break down in, in something that, that's run in a commercial 
way. At some point, uh, these companies are going to decide that it's cheaper not to bother that much more about astronomy. Uh, and then the world who want, where we want to do things like keep an eye out for asteroids um, is going to have to take the consequences. And we, we need to get a planning regime for space into place quickly. I think that's a really good point, Chris, yeah, and something that hopefully um, the learned societies and government and companies can take forward into the future. Uh, I just wanted to share two, two thoughts that I have on this as well, and they're very different from, from, from everybody else. So actually, I, I recently saw uh, one of the Starlink constellations. So shortly after launch, you, the, when they launch, they actually launch a, a group of satellites. And so shortly after launch, you actually see um, several satellites kind of crossing the sky relatively quickly. And it was absolutely amazing just watching it. Just watching these things that humanity put in the sky. You don't just see one moving across the sky. You can sometimes see a whole train of them moving across the sky. And my nine-year-old son loved that. I think more than just looking at the stars themselves, actually seeing the presence of humans in space, I think was really amazing. So although it does have a whole load of detrimental effects, these things can still be very beautiful. And my second and kind of more spurious point was the name Starlink is something that the UK astronomy community have had for a long time. So Starlink was the name of a, a kind of software service dating back to the 1980s. Did they actually pay us for the patent to this? Uh, obviously, this is a bit of a joke, but they did not invent that name. OK, but moving on to the next question. This is another good question for Lee. Um, and this is, again, an anonymous question, but it asks, could a tidally locked exoplanet have liquid water on its surface in the region between the heat and code? I guess the, the, the kind of sun facing side and the, and the um, anti-solar side. One of the things I've learned when talking to the extra solar planet community is that your expectations for these things often wiped out very quickly when confronted with the, the pantheon of different types of planets that we have out there. So frankly, I would say, yes, why not? You, uh, you can imagine circumstances with the, the thousands of planets we've currently detected and the millions of planets that we currently haven't yet detected where that kind of circumstance uh, might exist. So searching for the signatures of water vapor in a planetary atmosphere is about as far as we can get right now. But uh, Joe uh, might be able to correct me if I'm wrong, but I've heard of efforts of trying to p detect the, the glint of uh, standing bodies of surface liquids, potentially water, on the surface of another world, just like we did for the glint of sunlight off of Titan's methane seas, for example with the Cassini spacecraft. But uh, I, I would say that your imagination can run wild when it comes to extrasolar planets at the moment. I don't know if Jo has anything that she wanted to add there. Yeah, you, you're right that that kind of observation is planned, Lee. I don't think it's very close to fruition because we don't have the technology to do that at the moment, but it's certainly planned. And yes, I agree that it could be, it's entirely possible to have liquid water on a tidally locked planet as well. I think one, one of the key things is that in, in our solar system, we've only got one tidally locked planet, and that's, um, actually I'm not even sure, is Mercury tidally locked? I can't remember. No, it's a, um, it, no, it's, it's, in, not, is it? it's in a weird resonance, right? Yeah. So it's got yeah, some okay, aspects. Yeah, I knew it's yeah. something. But anyway, I, 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 with the Earth. The moon is tidally locked, but... Mer Mercury being the closest to the sun does have one very hot side and one very cold side which is the kind of scenario that I suppose you're picturing here for this tidally locked exoplanet but the reason Mercury has such a big temperature difference from between the day and the night is um, that it doesn't really have much of an atmosphere. Atmospheres are really important for transporting heat from day side of a planet to its night side so if you had a tidally locked temperate planet with a substantial atmosphere, then the temperature might not be so, so drastic on the day compared to the night. So you might be able to have actually relatively stable conditions, depending on how thick the atmosphere is and how efficient it is at transporting heat. That's great, thank you all. Um, so again, we have a, a quite, there's actually been quite a few questions asking about how uh, the panel got into astronomy, um, some, um, more specific questions about maybe what degrees you studied and what, what your career path was. But I think just to start off with, and I'll ask this to the entire panel, uh, we have a question from Jessica Connor who asks very simply, 
what inspired you to get involved in astronomy? And I'm going to get the panel to answer this in re reverse alphabetical order. So I'm going to start first, followed by Elizabeth. Um, so my interest in astronomy actually began when I was probably about nine. And it was actually from playing a computer game. And it was playing a computer game called uh, Frontier, which was the sequel to the, the very famous game Elite, which was kind of the very first space simulation. And I loved playing this game because you could fly to different stars and different planetary systems. Now, this has been done in loads of games. But what Frontier and Elite and that whole group did very well was actually making it as accurate as possible. The planetary systems that they imagined and the galaxy that they imagined was kind of real. So you could fly to these different stars that were all different. And we know that stars are all different according to their masses. So that was one of the things that really got me interested, first of all. And then after that, I guess the, the honest answer is when I was a university student studying physics, I had some very, very good astronomy lecturers who um, kind of encouraged me to take it up. But how about you, Elizabeth? Um, science fiction. I, I basically was, a, was surrounded by science fiction as a child, exposed to all of these ideas and concepts. And programmes like The Sky at Night were on television as well. And I saw those. My, my parents watched them. Um, I think I grew up accepting space as a normal part of the world around me and wanting to know more about it. Uh, I took a brief detour into archaeology but then rapidly turned back towards physics because I realised that while the human past is interesting, the deep past is even more so. Uh, and that's how I ended up in astronomy. Chris? Um, I, a couple of things. One was I was a kid who looked at the stars. So, so I remember standing out when I was six, seven and eight looking up, up at the night sky. Um, but really the thing that turned me into an astronomer was the sudden realisation during a talk by Patrick Moore that astronomers didn't know everything. Somebody asked a question and he said, well, I've told you what we know. And if I came back in 10 years time, it would all be completely different because the truth is no one knows about these subjects. And I just that and that 11 and just the idea that science was something that was ongoing that uh, there were still discoveries to be made just clicked for me uh, and luckily uh, I remain in complete ignorance about most of astronomy now uh, and I still enjoy it. So uh, I was never lucky enough to own a telescope in fact I was in my mid-20s I think before I even had an opportunity to look through a telescope for the first time and saw, saw Saturn um, but a little bit like uh, Elizabeth, uh, science fiction was an enormous part of my life when I was uh, a child and when I was a teenager. Things like Star Trek and Doctor Who and Star Wars would transport me to other worlds and I could perfectly well imagine that that was in our future as a civilization and that I might be lucky enough to live long enough uh, to see it. And it was only then during my sort of university career that I realized that there was a possibility of me having a career continuing to study uh, potentially towards this end. Thanks. Tim? So for me, I think in a way it's slightly different uh, than the things that everybody else has said because um, I didn't want to be an astronomer when I was growing up. I studied went to study physics at university because I wanted to be a pilot. Uh, and I didn't want to go through the Air Force because that wasn't really for me. So I thought, okay, I'll get a physics degree and then try and be an airline pilot. But what I discovered when I was doing my physics degree, uh, I did a physics degree, I didn't do an astronomy degree, but luckily uh, there were some astronomy modules in there and I just had really good teachers. And it just dawned on me that astrophysics is this real sweet spot, for me at least, where you have to use all types of physics. You have to use your understanding of gravity, your understanding of mechanics, your understanding of quantum mechanics, all of the parts of physics that you think of as some people might see as being disparate. You have to use all of them in physics because you're studying the whole un in astrophysics because you're studying the whole universe. And that really spoke to me and got me really excited and interested. And then I just took it from there. Really. Thanks, to, um, Michelle. Yeah, I guess my story is a bit more like Tim's as well. So when I was younger, I, I didn't really, I wasn't really into science at all. In fact, uh, it was a couple of years ago, me and my mum found one of my primary school reports where the teacher said, Michelle has no interest in science. I would much rather be writing stories. Uh, and I think that remained true for quite a while. Uh, and then in senior school, I was still trying to decide what to do for my 
um, what I wanted to do with life. And I, I decided that I wanted to take maths, physics, chemistry and biology as my A-levels and either become maybe some kind of scientist or a doctor. And I was quite into watching ER at that time, which was an American <laughs> hospital show. So I thought maybe I could be like a surgeon or something. Um, and I had to move schools to do those A-levels together because I went to a particularly bad school with very few science teachers um, initially. Uh, and then when I moved to my new school, um, I had to sign up for physics and the head of physics uh, told me that I should really think carefully about that because typically only boys do physics. And I think if I'm being completely honest, um, I don't like being told what I can't do. <laughs> so it made me really determine not only was I going to take physics, but I was going to be the best at it. Um, and that was certainly true for my A-levels. I was much better than the boys in my class. But then because I sort of really threw myself into it, I got really more into physics and into astrophysics in particular. So then I decided that's what I wanted to do for my degree. And then I just really enjoyed it. So I just kept doing it for as long as I could. And that turns out to be at least up until now. Um, so as long as this panel goes okay, hopefully I'll still be doing this tomorrow as well. Thanks, Michelle. That's a great answer. Jo? Um, I was a lot like Michelle when I was little. Um, I definitely preferred writing stories. I thought I was going to become an actress when I was a kid, um, which, you know, actually has served me quite well in terms of giving talks and things. Public speaking has always been a part of what I do that I actually really enjoy. Um, my dad is an astronomer as well, so I was always interested in astronomy, but not particularly keen on physics um, or science more generally when I was younger. Um, I had a fantastic physics teacher um, when I started my GCSEs who, I don't know why, but recognised that there was that I had some real potential to be very good at physics and would not shut up until I agreed to take it for A-level. And um, during my A-levels, I got a Nuffield bursary, which I think still exists. So I got a bursary to go and do some a research project over the summer in the middle of my A-levels. And I was fortunate enough to get to work with some of the team at the University of Leicester who developed one of the instruments for the Beagle 2 spacecraft um, that launched um, to Mars in 2003. So I spent my summer working on um, hypothetical scenarios actually for what that instrument might be able to detect. And I had the best time. I had a brilliant six weeks doing that. And I came out of that and I said, I want to do planets. I want to be a planetary scientist. That's it. That's great. Fantastic. So uh, can I do alphabet? Yes, yeah, so you are the last person in the panel. Sorry, I, I can't really do the alphabet. I'm not very good. I can do numbers, not words. Um, great. We've got another question here. This one I think is best answered by Tim. Um, this is from either Anthea or Rachel. Um, how do galaxies sometimes collide and merge and how much destruction results from such a merger? Yeah, so um, we do see uh, around us when we look out with our telescopes that galaxies do sometimes in their course through space, they happen close enough to one, each, one another that the gravity uh, results in them being captured. So they start to influence each other, they become bound to each other, and then they will spiral inwards and merge. That could be take a long time or it could be very quick if they're aimed at each other to begin with. Um, as for how much destruction happens, that's actually a really interesting question. So galaxies, although if you look at the example that here, this is a nice galaxy, it looks like a solid object, but actually it's not. It's full of empty space. So all of the stars in the galaxy, you could collide a galaxy together and the likelihood is that none of the stars will get anywhere close to actually colliding with one another. But that is not true with the gas that's in galaxies. So galaxies are permeated with clouds of gas and dust that are rotating around the center of the galaxy in the same way as the stars are, or oh, similar way to the stars are. And those clouds are volume filling, like the gas that fills your room right now that you're breathing, it fills the whole space. And so those clouds can collide. And when they do that, there's uh, a lot of fireworks, you can form a lot of new stars, uh, and that gas all falls to the center, so it becomes very dense. And you actually get these things called star bursts, where you form lots and lots of stars very, very quickly. And those are often triggered, at least in the local universe, by these types of mergers. So although individually there's no destruction from the hitting, you know, when we collide with the Andromeda galaxy uh, in a few billion years time, you shouldn't worry about the Earth hitting anything because it won't. They, there's too much empty space in galaxies. Clouds of gas do, and that does have effects on the galaxy. 
Thanks a lot, Tim. Yeah, I guess so uh, when galaxies actually collide, it's not so much destructive, they actually create new stars or it triggers the creation of new stars. So these big, uh, what we might think of as being destructive as before, are actually these creation events. And we know that a significant fraction of the stars in the universe are actually created in these events. Okay, so we have another technical question here. I think this one is, I think, best answered by Joe. Um, and it's from Anonymous and it asks, could you explain how a coronagraph looking for exoplanets works? Um, yes, briefly. So the way a coronagraph works um, is it actually, so it, you think of a normal telescope, what you want is to let all of the light through, right? So you don't want anything in the way. A coronagraph deliberately puts a physical stop in the middle where the basically where the center of your image would form so if you if you look at the star on the planet and you keep the star in the center of what you're focusing on it actually prevents the light from the star from hitting your detector it's not just as simple as blocking the star because if you've got a sharp edge and light goes past it it tends to diffract so you get lots of sort of fuzzy interference type patterns around it which you also have to remove so it's not just a single stop it's usually um, a single stop and then a, and then um, at a different place in the optics there's a ring that removes some of that diffraction so basically what you're doing is you're blocking the light from the star and the planet is off center in the image. So the light that comes from the planet still makes it onto your detector. And the reason we have to do that is that stars are so much brighter than planets. If you had the light from the star in your image, then you just simply wouldn't see the planet because the starlight would wash everything else out. So that's roughly how it works. Thanks for that, Joe. That's perfect. Okay, again, this is a bit of a general question. I won't ask anybody, everybody to answer it, but uh, do feel free to chime in if you do want to answer it. So how has the coronavirus pandemic affected the panelists' research and will it have a lasting effect? Does anybody want to say anything? Please? So, um, unfortunately, the pandemic has led to the closure of uh, astronomical facilities worldwide. And in particular, one that European scientists get to use is the, uh, the very large telescope out in Chile. Now, my own personal research is looking at giant planet atmospheres and how they evolve over long periods of time. And for that, I need a fairly regular time series. And I've got a good time series that spans back uh, two or three decades now. Unfortunately, gaps in the time series are an absolute nightmare when you're trying to interpret long-term cycles. So in my particular case, the closure of those astronomical facilities, whilst you might think, well, Jupiter's still going to be there next year when we get back up and running, unfortunately the phenomena that are at work won't wait for us to go ahead and look again. So I'm personally looking forward to when they can safely get back to those facilities and start taking observational data again. So I, Anybody else I want to add yeah, so we're suffering. We, we've, we've missed out on observations as well, particularly follow up from some of the discoveries on our Planet Hunters project where we're waiting on telescopes in Chile and elsewhere to, to reopen and, and, and so on. But I'm actually more worried about the, the people. So some people have been very productive and, and able to work, but it's clear that that's very uneven. And for many people with caring responsibilities or, or just um, who found the situation difficult, then um, it's been very difficult to get work done at home. And, and I think I, I worry this is a very sort of inside baseball answer, but I, I really worry as an astronomical community about how we're going to make sure that when we emerge blinking into the sunlight and hopefully when, when a vaccine is available or, or, or when the situation changes, that we make sure that everyone's treated fairly uh, and not based on whether they've had good internet at home and space to work and no kids to distract them and so on. So, so I, people are thinking about that, but I think it's important when we talk about the data to talk about the people as well. It's, it, it's not as if we've all been able to go home, open our laptops and work as if we're sitting in, in the office. Yeah, Can I, I add, sorry. Go on, Joe. Add to what, what Chris has, has said. Um, I know that several of us on this panel have have children and had children at home at various points during the pandemic I'm one um, and I think we'll all agree that it was it was challenging attempting to work full-time whilst fending off various requests for snacks and television and whatever else um, 
But one, one statistic that's really sort of stood out and people have been looking into this is that women in science have been massively disproportionately affected by this because the caring burden more usually, not exclusively, but more usually falls on women in a relationship. And people have used as a metric the number, number of papers that have been published, the number of scientific outputs and the submissions from female lead authors have have gone down significantly relative to submissions from male authors during the pandemic. So we can, there is actually, there are you know, clear statistics as to how uneven this effect has been. Uh, to mention one other thing, if that's okay. Um, you, one of the parts of the question was how you think it will change us in the future. Have I frozen again? I can still hear you, the video is better. You're okay. Out. Okay, I was just going to mention online conferencing. Uh, Steve organized a very successful online conference for the high redshift community. And um, I think that we have all been impressed with how the community has adapted to communicating and meeting online. Uh, we're all of us a little zoomed out, but um, nonetheless, there is some prospect in the future that this might reduce our burden in terms of travel and the expense of attending concerts which may be of help to some people. Yep so I completely agree I think there is a big cultural change so as Elizabeth mentioned I organized this online conference over the summer um, and we're planning doing it again so we're going to have a whole series of smaller conferences over the year and again next year and again because even without the pandemic there are good reasons to do this so minimizing international travel, which is particularly difficult, obviously, in terms of the environment, people with caring responsibilities. So I think in many ways, the pandemic will make us better because it's forced us to do things in a different way, which actually increases equity. Um, I'd just like to add my final comment on all of this is that I remain to be count I'm counting down the minutes until Monday when my children return to school and I can actually do some work. Um, what time I've had for work of moments has really been focused on teaching so having to move my teaching online and and um look after my students and as much as i love my children i'm craving to get back and actually do some science uh, and so that will happen on monday uh, and again thank you for all the answers um i think i'm going to ask this question to elizabeth but what does an astrophysicist actually do on a daily basis sit in front of a computer fundamentally <laughs> we most of us spend most of our time sitting in front of a computer these days many of us are dependent on data from big telescopes and big missions and that data is collected remotely and communicated to us electronically so even if we're looking at observational data we're doing it on a computer at our desk having said that there are still a number of small to medium sized telescopes still in operation uh, Warwick runs a one meter telescope and the gravitational wave transient follow up I mentioned and indeed an exoplanet search telescope. So a number of my colleagues in my department are involved in hands on data collection, but even they, I would say, spend the majority of their time looking at a computer. But what makes it worthwhile are those moments of realization or discovery or really being the first person to see something or to think about something um, that adds a sense of wonder to what might otherwise be more mundane office work. Thanks for that Elizabeth. So sorry I've just lost my next question. Um, okay so I'm actually gonna this is gonna, I'm gonna direct this one at Chris and I'm gonna try and merge a few questions together. Um, so when do you think we will go back to the moon? What might the benefits be? And do you think we should go to Mars? So assuming this is this is crude rather than robotic exp exploration. So um, let's start with the moon. NASA say that they're going to get there by 2024. That's not going to happen. Um, there's just not the money in the program to do that. And um, there's an election in the US which will change things, I hope. Um, so that's not going to happen. I would expect, though, the Chinese are pretty serious. And I would expect a Chinese landing on the moon within about a decade. Um, there is a plan. There is a series of, of processes. There is plenty of money. 
Uh, and I think it'll be like the Apollo missions. It will be a land spend a little while there and come back carrying a bag of moon rocks. And the benefit is really that, that you get the moon rocks back. So while robotic probes are amazing, um, there's an awful lot that my planetary science colleagues can do once you get material into a lab. And the best way to do that is to go there and get it. It's much easier than reducing your lab to something that can fly on a spacecraft. Um, we've also, people forget, I think, that we've only been to six places on the moon, all of them on the near side, most of them in lowlands. And you can imagine trying to understand Earth in all its variety by visiting six places for a couple of days each. Um, so, so, so I think there is real scientific impact, even if people are going because they want the Chinese or American or European flags on, on, on the surface. Um, there's obviously a lot of interest in going to Mars. Commercial companies like SpaceX uh, are making a, a, a lot of noise about the fact that they want to eventually go there. Um, I'm a big fan of Elon Musk's statement that he wants to die on Mars, but not on impact which I think is, is quite good twice. Um, do I think we should go? Um, I'm, I'm in two minds about this. I would love to share in the adventure of watching people try and reach so far from our home planet uh, and explore. Um, I would go myself if anyone particularly wants to pay me. I don't intend to put in any of the training or effort, but if somebody wants to take me to Mars Row, that would be great. I'd even go if it was a one-way ticket. Um, but I think Mars is a fragile environment. It's possible that there is still life or was life on the surface of Mars. Um, and at the minute, that's relatively uncontaminated by us. And I certainly start to get twitchy when we think about colonies of, of rich people hanging out for a holiday before we've had a chance to scientifically explore. So, so my preferred option would be to get Elon Musk and go to pay for it, for them to go to Martian orbit and then stay on Phobos or Deimos, the moons. And then you can have a lab there and control spacecraft on the surface with a joystick much more than we can from Earth and do the scientific exploration that way. But, but I think what will happen is people will go um, for the adventure, but I suspect that's still 20 years away. Thanks, Chris. Does anybody else have any thoughts on this? Not seeing any, so I'll move on to the next question. So again, this is um, not so much a general question, um, but not one that I know how best to engage with. Again, maybe this is actually best answered by Chris. Apologies for this, Chris. And Doug asks, what role do amateur astronomers still have to play? So there's a, I think there's a reasonable um, sense that people for decades have been saying that amateur astronomers no longer contribute useful uh, things to astronomy, and they're always wrong. Um, so, so just to run through very quickly the different types of amateur engagement, Lee's already mentioned sort of using data, particularly from planetary missions to create new visions uh, and to coordinate camera activity. There's a camera on Juno that's more or less directed by the team in association with online citizen scientists. We have a bunch of people sorting through data on Zooniverse, but there's still a role for people with uh, telescopes. Um, Michelle will know more about this, I suspect, but there's some deep imaging that amateurs are able to do that brings out fine detail in galaxies that no one else can do. And routine monitoring of the planets, which Lee will know about, is also still mostly done by amateur astronomers. There are still some discoveries made as well. Comet Borisov, for example, which was the first large interstellar visitor. So it's a comet from another solar system, it was discovered by a, a Russian amateur astronomer who got his name on it. So, so there are things that people can can do certainly online and even with a small small telescope yeah and i think just um obviously a lot of the amateur astronomy community are really engaged with uh promoting and supporting astronomy and so encouraging new students uh to become professional astronomers just through all those engagement efforts is really really important and just kind of sharing the wonder of our universe with as many people as possible they, they have a really crucial role um there are many 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 more amateur astronomers than there are um, academic astronomers in the country so they do have a really crucial role there as well. They also ask brilliant questions as we're discovering so, mm -hmm. so you should if, people should also keep prodding us with with annoying and difficult questions that's the go to find out more but both Michelle and Lee were waving so, so yeah. maybe they want to come in. Michelle? I, I just wanted to, to follow up on the monitoring of the, the planets because there's a whole army of amateur astronomers out there who are looking at the uh, the planets on a nightly basis and they 
because they're able to do that with the vast investment in time and kit and capabilities that they have, they're often the first to make discoveries. And just right now on Jupiter, for example, there's an enormous eruption of plumes and clouds, which is evolving on an hourly basis, an hourly basis, not just day by day. And so by having this army of amateurs across the globe who are taking observations, taking video, taking multi-wavelength observations and feeding this to a centralized database, that is an absolute treasure trove for those of us who are interested in studying meteorology and climate on, on other worlds. And we simply couldn't do it. We couldn't do it without the time investment from those amateur astronomers. Yeah, and I would just say that um, I work actually in a lot of projects where um, for probably the last 10 years, amateur astronomers have been providing the best science images for those projects. Um, specifically things like uh, studying the outskirts of galaxies, so not all, where all the stars are in the middle, but their sort of outer stellar halos, looking for signs of previous small merger events, which tend to show up as beautiful streams of stars. And they're really hard to image because they're so much fainter than the main galaxy. And working with people like David Martinez Delgado, who is a professional astronomer, but he has huge ties to this amateur astronomer com community. And he's been producing some of the, or they've been producing with him, uh, these fantastic images that really have shown us the sort of range of different types of mergers we can see in nearby galaxies. And I'd say the professional field's imaging capabilities are only just beginning to catch up with that. Um, so, you know, we call them amateurs, but I think there probably should be a better name for that. Uh, yeah, well, you, exactly you just stole my point there, Michelle. I was going to bring up exactly that. I think um, many of the amateur astronomers that I've met are much, much more capable of using a, a telescope than I am. Um, partly this is because I, I use space telescopes instead, um, but I, I think we do need a better name. Um, Sorry, I also wanted to put in a word uh, for, from my colleagues who work on variable stars because these very variable stars they go through flaring episodes and many of them do need regular monitoring the kind of time series data that lee was talking about but for individual stars uh, one of the reasons i'm mentioning it though is because i know steve and i both use hubble data and one of my colleagues relied on an amateur to help save hubble because he wanted to target a bright variable star in the local universe with hubble but could only do it if he knew it wasn't in a flare within a couple of hours of the scheduled observation. And the only person on the planet who could get him an observation at that precise time that would ensure that Hubble was safe was a home astronomer. I should put, because uh, they'll email me if not, but uh, <laughs> there are people who look for near Earth asteroids as well. So a lot of the people keep an eye on asteroids that might one day hit us or which might suddenly be discovered they're heading our way are amateur astronomers who feed into the same databases that the professional data does. So I think that's basically all of astronomy, um, more or less, and there's still plenty for people to do. I do wonder, is astronomy um, the science which has the kind of almost the widest reach in terms of people participating in it via things like the Zooniverse projects, but kind of more traditional amateur astronomy as well. Is there I any other science? Which is the good? other place that's close or probably beats us is ecology. Yeah. So think of millions of bird watchers and, and, and people doing that sort of thing. So, so it's close, but, but all of what's common is that those sciences, meteorology, geology have this legacy of sort of, mostly in this country at least, mostly 19th century amateurs who, who invented data collection and analysis for those subjects. And a lot of that still carries on. Yeah, that's great. Anybody else want to say anything here? Okay, so the next question is a follow on from the question that Tim answered, but I think it might be better answered by Michelle actually. So this is from Stephen who says, Tim's answer for colliding galaxies included the interaction of gases. But what about the dark matter? Might we speculate that that too should interact? So uh, the interesting thing about dark matter is that it doesn't actually behave like the gas. It behaves much more like the stars, which gives us uh, some idea of, uh, of what type of what type of thing dark matter should be composed of. And a good, a really good example for us knowing this is actually the study of a, a sort of colliding clusters uh, called the anten antennae. Is it no? No, the bullet cluster. Sorry, too many clusters. That probably is better for Tim that question, but um, yeah. So there's this this, this um, beautiful system of clusters. So two 
clusters of galaxies that sort of collided with each other and now sort of moving away from each other to the side. And the image where the stars are and where the gas is, you find that they're in two different places. Uh, because as the two clusters collide, the gas um, collides with itself, so it cools down and it sort of gets left between, sort of pulled out of each cluster, and you find the gas between the two clusters of galaxies now. And then all the stars and are sort of, sort of separated from the gas a little bit. Now you can then also measure where most of the mass, uh, so where most of the stuff in this colliding set of clusters lives. And that can tell you a lot about what you're looking at. So if the clusters were only made of stars and gas, then um, most of the material should be in the gas. So if you use gravitational lensing, so yeah, this is the image here. Um, if you use gravitational lensing, you can measure the mass distribution in this cluster. And you should find that if it's only coming from stars and gas, that most of the mass should live where that pink stuff is in the center of these two colliding clusters. Whereas all the stars lives in the blue part portions instead. Because there's more gas than stars, there should be most of the mass living in the center of that collision. But what the lensing results actually show is that most of the mass is found by the stars are, so away from the gas. Uh, and so it's moving with the stars. And we think this is sort of one of the sort of key pieces of evidence for dark matter, because there's way more stuff there than we would have thought uh, if we were only considering stars and gas. Um, hopefully that was a reasonable explanation to the question. Uh, thank you, Michelle. And you should all thank me for getting that image up really, really quickly. If only for a couple of seconds more. Uh, because I was doing that, I didn't look for my next question, but there is one question here which is not aimed at one of the panel members, but it's actually aimed at Sandra. So obviously, <laughs> I saw Sandra have to jump then. <laughs> obviously, this pandemic has had serious negative effects on the funding of the Hurstman Zoo uh, Science Centre, but what, if any, will the lasting impact be? Um, that's a good question. Um, I'd like to be able to answer that, but uh, who knows what the future's going to hold at the moment. But we're, we are so pleased that people have come back um, with all, uh, we've had full days pretty much since when we opened. Um, what we are looking forward to, what we're getting asked an awful lot is, um, ha, when's your next stargazing evening? And I'd love to be able to say a date. But of course, that's a real sticking point. So if anybody's got any, any real um, ideas, I've, I've got um, a grant in at the moment for uh, getting the camera attached to one of our telescopes. Obviously, they're historic telescopes, so we don't want to not use them anymore. So um, I'm going to have sort of hopefully live images through a screen. Everybody wants to put their eye to a telescope. Well, we can't do that at the moment. And we've got, if anybody's been here, you know that there's steep narrow stairs up to small domes as well. So that's another sticking point. But um, for, we are trying hard. We're going to get um, lots of different opinions about how we're going to go ahead with it. But we're not going to stop we are going to try our best because um, I, I was going to jump in on the amateur astronomy thing because we have a lot of our STEM ambassadors who are also amateur astronomers. And they are a huge and fantastic link between the general public and professional astronomers. I'm not saying you are scary guys, but you know, sometimes you're not as accessible and you can access, general public can access all, all the astronomy through the amateur astronomers, so, um, and which is great. So, keeping our fingers crossed, we are, you know, we're still here, we're still going to carry on and uh, we are going to be opening the telescopes and doing stargazing evenings as soon as we possibly can. Sandra, how do, there are about 77 people watching this live and lots of people I hope will watch later on, how can people help you? Uh, in particular, how can people send you small amounts of money that might help right now? We are on our uh, web page, that's uh, of the Astro Astronomy Festival web page, we've got a crowdfunder button. And if you can go along to the crowdfunder button and if you are able to donate anything, uh, we don't get any external funding at all and our Astronomy Festival was our biggest fundraising event of the year. Um, so if you are able to do that, we'd be so grateful. Thank you. Thank you very much. I'm, I'm, I, I'm very, I get very emotional when I, I see this panel of, of astronomers in front of me. I, I, it's just an amazing thing that's happening today. Um, I know you can't be with us, we can't see you. There's an awful lot of people come back to the festival year on year and they've become our friends as well. Um, but if you can, please go to that crowdfunder um, uh, page and, and donate what you can. We would be so grateful, thank you. 
hopefully next year all the panel can be there in person yes. with everybody yes, else please. as well. Yes, please. You are all invited, of course. <laughs> So we're, we're approaching about the last 15 minutes now. So people, if you do have questions, then please do post them in. Uh, one good point has been made here by Jay Brand, that, and I had no idea that this was the case, that apparently the word amateur literally means somebody who loves their subject. I had no idea that was the case. And so obviously we should be uh, continuing to use that term, but really convincing people to use it and to actually know the actual meaning of it. So. Uh, it's amazing that I've learned something. That's fantastic. Okay. Um, oh, wow. This is a question for me. So this is really exciting. This wasn't a plant at all. This is really directed at me. Actually, maybe Elizabeth as well. Um, this is from Charlie. So I, I only just saw this question, which is why it excited me so much. Uh, and the question is, what is the largest observed redshift for a galaxy? And how much further will we be able to look with the James Webb telescope? Okay. So just to answer this question, redshift is a way that we can work out the distances to objects. Um, it's something that's very relatively easy to measure for distant galaxies. And we know that there's a correlation first measured by Hubble that links redshift to distance. Now, added onto this, uh, we also have the fact that um, the further away an object is, the earlier in the universe's history we're actually seeing that object. Okay. So today the record holder is about a redshift of 10, but that doesn't really mean anything. What a redshift of 10 really means is that we're seeing a galaxy or a different object when the universe was only about 500 million years old compared to its current age of around 14 billion. Now this maximum number, this, this 10, this was measured by Hubble and it really is the, the biggest number that Hubble could ever measure. And that's because the light from more distant galaxies get shifted progressively into the infrared where Hubble can no longer see it. And so the, the, the thing that's going to change this in the future is the James Webb Space Telescope. James Webb extends much further into the near infrared. Okay, it's a much larger telescope so it can see many fainter objects. As to what is the highest redshift that it's going to see, we actually don't know that answer because we don't have a very good model for how many galaxies and how bright the galaxies are in the very early universe. Um, so we do have models for it, but um, lots of the models disagree with each other. And so it could be that we find something at redshift 15, could be we find something at redshift 20. If we're getting to around redshift 20, we're talking only a couple of hundred million years after the Big Bang, and we might really be seeing the very first generations of stars and galaxies to form in our universe, which is one of the things that obviously because it's my field, I'm really looking forward to. Uh, while I look for another question, Elizabeth, do you have any thoughts on this as well? Um, certainly, yeah. Red fifteen or twenty. It's harder to say. We lost you a little bit there as well, but I, I think you kind of concurred with my answer if I got it right. Oh, we seem to have lost Elizabeth again. Uh, we have another question for Chris here, um, and this is that during lockdown, have you actually seen an upsurge in people signing up for things like Zooniverse? Yeah, we've been busier than ever. So, so um, the, the way we think about this is our normal record came when we used to collaborate with Brian Cox on the Stargazing Live programs and he'd stare into the camera and tell his audience to come and help us out with our various projects and that was a big deal. Every day was like that for, for a few months in, in March and April and it's been busy since. So uh, we know why that is. We think that some people who do have spare time in the situation that we find ourselves in, I really appreciated the ability to contribute to something, like to collectively do something and, and try and think about space and not about whatever was going on here on Earth. So, so it's been really heartwarming and, and exciting to see that. Um, uh, but there's plenty of data left. Our scientists have put more projects together and um, I hope people will be able to dig in whenever, whenever they can. Great, thanks Chris. Um, this is a question for Joe, uh, and again related to the James Webb Telescope, but how will the James Webb Telescope help in detecting exoplanets? And this is from Theodore. 
So, uh, James Webb won't really detect exoplanets, it will do better than that. Um, so it will allow us to look in detail at the atmospheres of planets that we already know exist. So the kinds of spacecraft that are designed to detect exoplanets operate differently to James Webb. So they are things like Kepler, which is now finished, and the current mission called TESS. And what they do is they just, they pick a, a single but quite broad band of light to look in, and they collect all the light, all the photons within that band, and they measure the brightness of a star over a period of time and look for dips in that brightness that would correspond to a planet passing in front of the star. James Webb can view these events as well, but instead of just looking at a single, a single wavelength or a single band of light, it's going to look right from the very reddest end of the visible, as Stephen said, all the way into the infrared and much further into the infrared than Hubble can access. And what it allows us to do is to split up that light into its constituent wavelengths or colours. And specific gases that might reside in the atmospheres of these planets absorb um, sort of fingerprints of different colours of light. So we can identify them based on which colours appear to be missing more when the planet passes in front of the star, because some of that starlight will be filtered through the edge of the planet's atmosphere. So we can already do this to an extent with Hubble. Um, we've detected water vapour, for example, Chris already mentioned that in the atmospheres of virtually every planet we've looked at, actually, water vapour is pretty much everywhere. Um, but with James Webb, we'll be able to look for different molecules that we can't currently access with Hubble. And one of probably the most interesting of these is ozone. So we have ozone in our atmosphere. Um, it's three oxygen atoms stuck together. In our atmosphere, it resi it's resides in a layer about 10 kilometers above the surface and it's created when common or garden oxygen, two oxygen atoms stuck together, gets hit by some ultraviolet light, um, breaks up and reforms in a different way. And if we see that in the atmosphere of another planet, it would be a good indicator that the atmosphere has quite a lot of oxygen in it, which is interesting to us because that could be an indication that there might be something putting the oxygen there, i.e. something living. It wouldn't be an absolute smoking gun because there are other things that can put oxygen in an atmosphere, but it would be very, very interesting indeed. Excellent. Thank you, Joe. Yeah, you, you were hesitant to say the word, but I'll be honest, aliens. We're all after the aliens, right? Great. This next question is one for Lee. So this is from Gemma, who asks, why are there so many moons around the gas giants, but relatively few in the inner solar system? That's a, that's a really great question. And in fact, um, people are, have been trying to explain the architecture of our solar system through numerical simulations where they put the various ingredients in the right place and then let it evolve via gravitational interactions for many years now. And the challenge has always been, how do you go from um, small, rocky sort of seeds of planets to the kind of planets that we then see in our solar system? And the thing, the piece of the ingredient that really helps in terms of having a uh, a lot of material in orbit around the giant planets is the presence of something called an ice line. That is, when the sun, um, the sun's effects are heating up the inner part of the solar system and only allow rocky material to exist close in, whereas in the outer solar system it allows ices of things like water, things like carbon monoxide, even ices of nitrogen to exist out at great distances, and that provides the seeds you then need for the giant planets. The giant planets then act as their own seeds for pulling together material from, um, from their surroundings, uh, opening out uh, rings within the disk as they're forming. And all that uh, detritus, all that debris from the formation of the planets then allows uh, satellites to form. The big problem is that we don't really know what the insides of a lot of these satellites are like. Okay, We, we have broad brush estimates of it's got so much, uh, so much ice, so much water, so much uh, rock, and that's blended together in different proportions depending on how deep you go. But what we can't do is go and sort of thinly slice up these planets to find out exactly what they're made of. For things like Jupiter and Saturn, because we've had missions there, we've got a fairly good handle on the proportion of rock and ice within their interiors. But go to somewhere like Uranus or go to somewhere like Neptune, where we've only had that single 
flyby mission by Voyager 2 back in the, in the late 80s. And we really don't have a great handle, not only about the satellites, but also what Uranus and Neptune are, are really made of. And that's a key missing ingredient in this puzzle of figuring out how planets form and how their satellite systems form. Crack that puzzle and we'll be able to apply that knowledge to some of the distant extrasolar planetary systems that Joe has been talking about. Thanks for that, Lee. And I just want to pick up on uh, one word that you said a few times then, puzzle. Uh, lots of people think that maybe physics and astronomy, it's all been solved already, but hopefully this uh, Zoom session has kind of showed you all that there is still a tremendous amount for us to do. There's a tremendous amount of work out there for astronomers to do. So astronomers and physicists and other scientists are as relevant as ever. There are mystery after mystery. If anything, as we look deeper and deeper at the universe, we, we never actually end up we do, we do answer some questions, but inevitably we always find more questions than we've actually answered. And I do wonder sometimes whether it's just some kind of big cosmic joke that uh, the harder we dig, right, we never actually get down to the bottom. Um, but it's fun as well. It's always nice to have questions. I think, I think that, that puzzle aspect of it, that problem solving aspect is something we try to emphasize our, to our students at Leicester and across the UK, that what we're doing is providing you with a, with a toolkit, the maths, the physics, the chemistry, hopefully some of the biology, but also the, the computation and software design. And what you do with that toolkit is then up to you. But when faced with a problem in cosmology or gravitational astrophysics or planetary science, you've suddenly got that, that background of, of tools that you've learned to apply to one of these these great puzzles that, uh, that are out there and it's it's often a surprise even even to us when you come up with an answer to something having used all these tools but uh, that uh, that is one of the reasons that I love this job so much is because you can surprise yourself with what you figure out by looking at the data. Yeah I mean it is, it is a fantastic job and I know there's lots more questions on careers that I'm going to try and answer another one of them before we end. One more kind of science question. And I'm, I'm actually not sure who best to direct this to. Maybe Elizabeth, maybe Michelle. Maybe both of you can chime in. Um, and this is from Tim, who asks what the panellists' views are on Betelgeuse about to go supernovae and what might we expect to see if it does? I think the consensus is that it's very unlikely Betelgeuse uh, will go supernova anytime soon. It's a very massive, large, red, very variable star with huge convection cells on its surface. So big changes in its light over time. And while it's been going through a dip, it is now coming out the other side of that dip. And um, it's it's been extreme but not beyond what you might expect for a star of that type. So while Betelgeuse might go supernova any time in the next 10,000 years or so, there's no more reason to believe it will be tomorrow than in 10,000 years time. Thanks Elizabeth. Michelle, do you have anything to add there? Uh, only if it were to go supernova it would be super cool so I think that was one of the reasons astronomers were so excited that we kind of knew it probably wasn't going to go but everyone was just clinging on to that idea that it might do and because it was going to be so bright that you know the explosion you should be able to see actually during the day uh, in the sky not just at night so that would be like mind blowing. and we'd learn so much cool stuff from actually watching something go supernova near by so I think that that would have been cool. I surprised myself and decided I didn't want it to go. When it was fading, I was so freaked out by Orion looking different. And maybe this is <laughs> growing up looking at the sky. I found it deeply disturbing that Orion had changed. Uh, and I was relieved to see it. It happened sort of just as we were locking down and just seeing Orion come back made me sort of sent, feel that the cosmos was all right. So I, I'm, I don't care what we've learned. I want Betelgeuse to stay there. Uh, but I understand that if you study supernovae, that, that's probably not your attitude. Well, I mean, I don't, yeah, I don't really say oh, those, but I was just really excited that I got to show people like astronomy, like stars changing in real time. Like that was actually for me, like a big, yeah. a lot of my friends who normally ask me many questions, I had, they had me pointing out Orion every time we went out in the evenings and it was just, you that's know, cool. being able to see that the star was, you know, noticeably less bright and compare it to another star that it used to be brighter than. And that was a really amazing I'm actually, so I had a great, I really enjoyed it getting dimmer. <laughs> so this is where I convince everybody that I'm not a real astronomer, but is Betelgeuse one of the shoulders of Orion? 
yeah the the name a, a loose translation of the name is armpit of the great one so so top left ah oh, i was right that's amazing so maybe i'm a real astronomer fantastic uh so we've had loads of questions about careers so i think i just wanted to end on one of on one of those because obviously part of our job and part of the reason why we're here today is to encourage the next generation of astronomers and scientists and people who are going to use these skills so i was just hoping that maybe tim because you haven't answered a question recently whether you can just give a, a quick overview of your career and what what are the kind of stages in becoming an astronomer yeah okay um so i think the first thing is um if you want to become a professional astronomer you probably need to go to university to study physics um that could be you did it at, you did it straight out of school it could be you go back and do it but uh that physics is really what you need to know you could do that as part of a direct astrophysics course or you could do straight physics like i did really they're going to teach you the same tools which is how you mathematically analyze uh the universe um, and have that background that you need and also the computational skills and the, the skills about how to think about those type of things so that's sort of the first stage once you if you go get that that background in the physics so then after that the traditional path that leads to going into astronomy professionally is you need to do a phd so you find uh, a university somewhere with uh, someone doing research that really speaks to you and uh, a phd is not the same as a normal degree it's a labor of love in a way that um, you have to be really into what you're going to do you don't want to take something because it was the one thing you're offered if you're not you don't care about it because you won't succeed you have to care about what you're going to do so you need to find that that opportunity and there are phd positions available at universities all over the country and all over the world that, that would hopefully do that for you so that's typically in the uk at least it's three to four years of study uh doing your own research publishing in peer-reviewed journals until you get a phd then you then you become a doctor uh so then after that typically for most people you'll end up get, getting work experience in different places around the world. So you may go out, uh, spend three years uh, somewhere else in Europe, somewhere uh, in the US, could be in Asia somewhere, Australia, really there's many opportunities in Africa. Um, so often people end up going abroad, they don't have to. You can also have professional astronomers who spent their whole career in the UK also. Um, so you would typically do, on average, maybe two of these type of postdoctoral positions, we call them. Um, and then hopefully if you're uh, lucky and you're doing great work and everyone uh, appreciates that, then you can get a position at a university or an observatory um, where you can, um, you have that sort of job security and you can run your astronomy career alongside either teaching the next generation in the university or uh, helping run telescopes uh, in the instance of an observatory. Uh, so those are the sort of very traditional routes to doing it. But uh, as was mentioned earlier, I think it's important to say that we don't just need more people like us. The whole industry around astronomy and space needs people with so many different talents. We need people who can organize events like this to reach out to the next set of people. We need software engineers. We need um, project managers, all of these different types of skills. Whatever you're good at, it's actually needed somewhere in this whole industry. So you don't have to go down this traditional route if that's not for you. There are other ways to be involved as well. Thanks, Tim. That's a great answer. So we're just past the, the half past three mark. So I think I set this to be 90 minutes, or at least that's what I told the panel. Um, I'm just wondering, do any of the panelists have any additional thoughts while I just share something? Anybody have anything to say? So all I was going to share, and hopefully this is now working, hopefully we can all see this, is just some other events which I've identified that are coming up soon. So I've been very selective in these events, um, mostly because they're either in Sussex or they have involvement from people in Sussex. But um, I organize a series of online lectures called Sussex Universe, which isn't actually just astronomy anymore. It's everything that the University of Sussex does. But our next lecture is an astronomy lecture, um, which also features a live Q and A. So you can, Get the opportunity to again join via zoom and actually ask the speaker some questions after watching their talk and then we have the national astronomy week which is taking place at the middle of november this year this is focused on mars now this will also feature a live q a and i think some of the panel members here will be returning for that i think that live q a is going to focus specifically on 
um, whether there is life in the universe. And then the Royal Astronomical Society has been organizing online talks um, over the last few months. I know myself and Michelle and maybe others have been given some of these talks as well. Um, and there are countless opportunities on the internet via YouTube to learn more about astronomy and to engage with astronomers. Um, and so I just wanted to mention that and just thank the entire panel again and obviously Sandra for facilitating today. Um, and just, yeah, thank you everybody for the time and thank you everybody for your excellent questions. It was really, really fun to answer them. Do you have uh, else to say? I've got, I just want to say thank you so much for all the panelists for giving up your time today. It's been really good, excellent. I think it's been really engaging. Um, fantastic questions, fantastic answers. Uh, so thanks very much. And, and again, thanks to all our, our uh, participants who've logged in and I hope uh, you know, you've had your questions answered. Sorry if you haven't had your questions answered, but you know, these things go, it's just, it's, it's, it's just, you know, time constraints. But um, thanks again for supporting the Astronomy Festival. I hope to see you back at Person Zoo in person next year. Uh, and as I say, if you are able to donate, do go to the crowdfunding page. But thank you very, very much for uh, attending today. And just one final comment from me. Is it aliens, Chris? Oh, he didn't bring. <laughs> oh, oh, <laughs> damn. Yeah, I was really hoping. <laughs> Okay, thank you everybody okay, for listening. Thank you, Apologies that we couldn't answer every question. Um, but yeah, it was it was great to answer all your questions. And have a good uh, rest of your weekend, everybody.